I would like to uh, dive into a bit more of an academic. Uh, I know my wife will roll her eyes. She doesn't love it when I'm a bit more academic. Uh, but a bit more of an academic message today. I want to talk about uh, the Gospel of Luke, just at, like as a, as a, uh, a subject all by itself, and then do a, a very short Bible study after that. Uh, and the reason uh, I want to talk about Luke is because probably about five years ago, I started kind of loosely preaching my way through Luke. I think part of that was because uh, a guy that I really admire named Greg Boyd had been preaching through the book of Luke for a long time. And uh, so I had been influenced a lot by his teaching. But also independent of that, I, I really love the gospel of Luke. And I want to talk about that today because people keep asking me why Luke. So of the kind of uh, 24 chapters in Luke, I think I've preached through about 19 or 20 of them. Uh, I have a little chart, but it's not perfect, and I kind of have been slowly working my way through each of those um, chapters over the years. Um, uh, but so the answer to my question, the question of why Luke, is what I am hoping to cover today. And uh, I think it, it's important because Luke is distinct. All the Gospels are distinct. We get four very different pictures uh, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and uh, so I'm going to start with Luke and just say, well, Luke was written about 60, 70 AD. There's not a lot of contention when it comes to Luke. Uh, so everyone agrees, all the academics, all the scholars agree. Luke wrote the book of Acts, and he also, uh, before that, he wrote the Gospel of Luke. Um, in fact, Luke wrote more of the New Testament than any other author, even Paul. Uh, so the, the length of the Gospel of Luke and Acts combined actually uh, outwrites all of the books that Paul put together in the New Testament. And the good news for uh, scholars of, of the Greek text is that Luke writes excellently. Uh, he's a, he was a language nerd. His books have the best literary Greek in the whole New Testament. And so it isn't contested. It's pretty clear who wrote it. A lot of books in the, in the Bible, they argue about who wrote it. They think it might have been multiple different authors, whatever that. Uh, but with Luke, they all just say, yeah, no, we think that Luke wrote it. Um, any contention has been kind of pushed aside. Now there is pretty much universal agreement. So the Apostle Paul talks about Luke because Luke was at times an opinion, uh, a companion of the Apostle Paul. And so Paul refers to Luke as the beloved physician and a fellow worker. Uh, so what we know of Luke is that he was a physician and we know that he uh, journeyed with Paul. Uh, the other most unique thing that we know about Luke, though, is that he was a Gentile. Uh, so Luke, even though uh, normally when we think about the Gospels, we think that they were all disciples, the authors. Luke was not a disciple of Jesus. Uh, Luke was a Gentile who came to faith at a, a later time. And he is the only Gentile author in the New Testament. So Luke didn't write as an eyewitness. Luke went around as a historian and he got what uh, he spoke to the disciples, uh, a number of them, and probably also, I think it's the Gospel of Math, uh, uh, Mark. I think he, um, he wrote after that, so he adopted a lot of what was written in there. Uh, and so his letter is written to a guy named Theophilus. And Theophilus, he gives him a title, he calls him the most excellent Theophilus, which makes it likely that Theophilus was a Roman uh, in the government, an official of some sort. And uh, so he was like a, a patron of the arts or something like that. So he obviously supported uh, Luke when he was writing these things. And it chronicles the ministry of Jesus based on the eyewitness accounts that Luke was able to gather up from testimonies, both written and interviews. Uh, and and that includes, like I said, the Gospel of Mark. So it's fair to assume, though, that when he wrote this letter to Theophilus, that he expected that other people would be reading it. It wasn't just, um, you know, he didn't think it was a private correspondence. He knew that he was writing and that this would be disseminated amongst other believers. And he wrote as though it was a really important document. Uh, so the, the Gospel of Matthew is very much pitched to a Jewish audience uh, and it's intended to show how Jesus fulfills Old Testament messianic pro prophecies. Uh, whereas the Gospel of Luke is kind of the, a different to that in that it's written to a Gentile audience. So Matthew wrote to the Jews and Luke is writing to the Gentiles. And it's a, a, a message of hope to proclaim the good message of Jesus to a Gentile audience. 
Uh, and we can see that in the language that Luke uses. So in the in, in Matthew, uh, he'll use things like he'll say uh, scribe, whereas Luke will say lawyer, or uh, Matthew will say uh, rabbis, whereas Luke will say master. So he uses more kind of Greco-Roman language or Greek terminology in order to get his ideas across because that's uh, the language that his audience would understand. Uh, and he also uses like descriptions of things and he talks about landmarks and uh, Jew- and uh, customs and pal- Palestinian geography and things like that in a way that says his audience understood all of these broader things, not just the Jewish worldview. Uh, so whereas with the Jewish worldview, he goes to lengths to explain things, uh, assuming that they wouldn't have understood it. Uh, So like in Luke 20, uh, he describes the different beliefs between the Sadducees and the Pharisees, something that all the Jews would have understood, but his audience may not have realized that within the hierarchy uh, socially and uh, administratively of the Jewish church, that there was differences in views. So he explains that to his audience. Uh, So that's one of the reasons that I like the book of Luke, because Luke is writing to a Gentile audience who doesn't understand everything about a Jewish culture, which perfectly describes kind of our circumstance. We're largely not Jewish, and most of us don't have a great understanding of ancient Jewish culture. So it helps us when reading the Gospel of Luke because he adds a little bit extra to help explain things. Now, the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke are treated differently to the Gospel of John. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called uh, often, uh, especially in academic writing, they're called the synoptic Gospels. Uh, So this word uh, comes from, the synoptic word comes from synopsis, which comes from sin, meaning together in the Greek, and opsis, like like your eyes, meaning um, to have sight. So they are meant to be viewed together. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke largely cover the same content, the same stories, the same narrative. And so we look at them together, uh, whereas John, John was, uh, a, a, well, he was kind of a weirdo. Uh, so John's book almost didn't even make it into the Bible because it was so extreme. He was uh, more mystical and unusual and poetic. And uh, so his gospel in academic sense, in an academic sense, is treated completely separate to the uh, Matthew, Mark and Luke. In fact, 90% of Mark's gospel can be found in either Matthew or Luke. So there is a lot of, so we think Mark came first and then the other, uh, and then Matthew and Luke have uh, used Mark as one of their references when they've put together their their accounts of what's going on. There's a few instances where phrases uh, and whole sentences at times are completely identical across those. Uh, So the... The question of which sources were used and which is first and which, thats it's called the synoptic problem. It's a very, very unexciting area of academic study. Uh, but nonetheless, it's, it's been a, a place of a lot of debate for um, theologians over the years. But each of the, the Gospels, each have their own unique content as well. So, And this is especially true for the Gospel of Luke, which is another reason I really like it, because Luke records more of Jesus' early life and he finishes later after um, the resurrection than Matthew and Mark and John. Um, So the first two chapters of Luke detail the birth and childhood of Jesus. They're more detailed there than in the other Gospels. And Luke also contains testimony of a whole bunch of stories that I really, really love that just aren't in the other Gospels. So Zacchaeus, the tax collector, and the road, uh, the walk on the road of Emmaus after the resurrection, and even things like uh, the uh, what is it, the uh, the Good Samaritan, and the prodigal son, and the rich man and Lazarus. They're only in the Gospel of Luke. They're not in the other Gospels. So these are kind of stories that I've really enjoyed and wanted to teach about. So that's why I've been drawn again to the the Gospel of Luke. So the question is, what is unique? Um, What's the message of the Gospel of Luke? Well, Luke says that right at the beginning uh, of his letter, he says that he wants to create a factual account of the life of Jesus so that he can encourage Theophilus and anyone who would read the the, um, thing that he is recording here. So he wants Theophilus to be really confident that what he's writing is accurate and true. So at his heart, Luke is a historian. So he makes sure that he places things in history and that he um, uh, is, is very careful about his details to ensure that there is no question as to the credibility of his story. So reading through Luke gives you an impression that he really thought that he was writing the most important book in history. He really thought this was 
are absolutely essential for the world to hear what he was saying. So he moves from different styles of writing really quickly and poetry and repetition and chiasm and all these ideas in a really beautiful way. And perhaps in the English, we don't uh, get to appreciate that as much as, as uh, in the Greek. Um, but he has a very poetic structure to his writing. And he was very careful with his research. And in his writing, uh, I really love how he is particularly attentive to the plight of those who are placed on the outside of society. Uh, so he is really concerned about those who are sick, or those who are uh, poor or underprivileged or the possessed and bereaved, the foreigners, the children and the women. In fact, one of the big things that draws me to the Gospel of Luke is uh, how often he addresses the role of women uh, in a more positive light. Now, there is some academic kerfuffle. Some people think that he isn't doing that, whatever. Uh, but my opinion is that, that Luke has a very high view of women. In fact, the uh, the prevalence of dialogue that includes women is most um, concentrated in Luke compared to anywhere else in the New Testament. So Luke addresses the needs and plight of women more than anyone else. Uh, the other thing that is central to uh, Luke's gospel is prayer. So it's the only gospel that records Jesus praying at his baptism uh, before choosing his disciples and before the transfiguration. Uh, one of the commentaries I read, uh, it said that the connection of prayer to a powerful presence of the Holy Spirit is thus especially prominent in Luke's writing. See, but despite the formal and detailed and consistent way that, uh, that Luke writes, looking for that accurate, accurate historic message of, of Jesus, uh, there is also a very clear evangelistic, evangelistic message in the Gospel of Luke. More than any other gospel, uh, this um, gospel shows that Jesus and his offer of salvation is for all people. Uh, so it's for Romans and Samaritans and for women and lepers, the poor and the outcasts and the children and the tax collectors and all the prodigals, all of those things. Uh, Luke makes it really clear Jesus is for everyone, not just for the Jew, but for everyone. The word salvation doesn't even appear in the other synoptic gospels. Uh, it appears once in John, but six times Luke mentions salvation. Uh, he uses the term to save more than any other gospel writer. And it's the only gospel that actually straight up just says Jesus is saviour. So the, the gospel of Matthew gives us uh, Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, whereas the gospel of Mark gives us uh, Jesus as uh, the suffering son of God. And the gospel of John gives us the divine son who reveals the father. But Luke, who is a Gentile man and a doctor and a historian and a companion of the apostle Paul, his gospel gives us Jesus, the savior of the world. And it's not just Israel's savior, but the savior of all humankind. And I think that now that we are so separated from first century Judaism, um, Knowing that Jesus is the saviour of the whole world is, is really important and really beautiful. So with a, uh, a sense of passion and authenticity and, um, and, you know, and a concern for the truth, Luke paints a picture of a flesh and blood saviour. In, um, uh, in, in the book of Luke, we come to find a Jesus that isn't like the traditional pagan gods uh, of the, the rest of the world, not just the, 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 you know, in Judaism, but the, the rest of the, the world that existed at that time. We find that Jesus is nothing like their pagan gods or their Eastern mythical, uh, mystical figures. What we find is that Jesus is a real, fully human man, but also a fully divine man. Uh, we find this beautiful picture of Christ. So what I want to do now with that, just that little introduction aside, uh, I want to jump in and do a very, very short Bible study. Now, uh, this is a section of scripture I was reading with Ari uh, because I'm just such a, a holy and, and, and wonderful, godly father who does a Bible study about once every year. Uh, so uh, I want to read from Luke chapter 3 for you uh, and just the first couple verses because I think that it typifies what Luke is doing. So it says here, it says, In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, where Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Eturia and Traconus, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. 
Now, a lot of the time when we read sections of scripture exactly like that, uh, or or when we're reading through like a, line, a lineage or a genealogy or something like that, it's easy to just fall asleep and just try to and even just skip that section altogether. But when Luke writes these things, he's doing this for a really important reason. He isn't just listing off every ruler that exists at, at the time for fun. He's listing them off because he's saying this happened in real history. He is placing the Gospel of Luke into actual history. And it's it's something that can be verified and that, it, that says you can trust what I'm writing. Luke's saying to Theophilus, but not just Theophilus, he's also saying to whoever it is that reads this, I am telling you, something that can be trusted as true and as history. I'm not writing to you a, um, a parable right now. I'm not writing to you a, a mythology or some kind of made-up story. This is the true account of Jesus that you can trust that happened in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar when Pontius Pilate was in charge of Judea and the you know Herod and Philip and uh, Lysanias uh, were all ruling around um, the, the region and the priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas was happening. Now, for a long time, historians actually used this as a way to undermine the Gospel of Luke. They said, well, we know of Tiberius and we know of um, the, the Herod and Philip and Lysanias, but we don't know of An- An- Annas and Caiaphas and we're not so sure about Pontius Pilate. And because of this, we think that it's not true. Um, and then they found archaeological evidence to say it was true. And this is in recent history. So in uh, Caesarea Maritima, which is um, right on the on the Mediterranean coast, it's um, a city that was had a huge um, kind of sporting facilities and everything. It was a, an incredible place. Uh, and uh, not long ago, in uh, it was in uh, 1961, they found a, a stone, what they called being used in secondary use. So it means that... Uh, the, the city had you know fallen apart and then they collected the rocks or the stones and used it to rebuild stuff. So they were they were digging up something and they found a stone that had been put into secondary use that actually recorded on that um, uh, that stone that Pontius Pilate, was the prefect of all Judea, which is to say he was the governor of Judea. So they found this evidence that proved the identity and also the um, title and role of Pontius Pilate. And so all the Wowsers were disappointed because it said that the Gospel of Luke was perhaps telling the truth. Uh, And all of the Christians said, we told you that Luke was telling us the truth all along. And the same is true with Caiaphas. So Caiaphas was a name they couldn't find, but then in 1990 they found this ossuary, which is like a uh, a tiny coffin. Uh, an ossuary is where they put the remains of an important person, and it was this really ornate uh, ossuary that had Caiaphas's name and information on the side of it. And it goes a long way to show that Luke was talking about true history and that these people really existed. And it gives us a perfect time in history as well. Because now we talk about, you know, in the year of our Lord 2020, so we can talk about history, but then. They didn't have a universal dating system on the basis of Christ's birth. They only had um, dates in reference to who was in charge. So in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, this gives us a very, very specific window of time when these things happen. Right, so all that said. uh, So here's the thing. What I learned from that section of scripture is not just Luke is saying this is true. It's also saying Everything is upside down in God's kingdom. Right from the outset here, he's saying everything is upside down. See, the word of God did not come to Tiberius Caesar. The word of God uh, did not come in his palace uh, and the military might of the ruler of the known world. That it didn't come to Pontius Pilate, who was probably living in Caesarea Maritima and traveled into Jerusalem because uh, Caesarea Maritima had become the center of the, uh, the Roman world in that area at that time. It wasn't in Jerusalem, uh, but he would have a, a place where he went back and forth. But that's not where the word of God came. The word of God didn't come to Tiberius Caesar or to Pontius Pilate, and it didn't come even to uh, the the Tetrarch. So a Tetrarch is, uh, so we had Herod the Great, who was this great builder, terrible human being, uh, was an awful person. But when he died, he split up all of the Galilee, uh, Judea area into three pieces, and each of his sons took one of those pieces. So a Tetrarchy means that there is multiple kings that rule an area. So Herod's sons all ruled different areas, and in none of those areas did the word of God come. They didn't, it didn't come to Tiberius Caesar, and it didn't come to Pontius Pilate, and it didn't come to any of the, the Jewish kings, and it didn't come even to the high priests. 
to Annas and Caiaphas. That isn't where the word of God came. You see, in the kingdom of God, everything is upside down. So the word of God came to John, uh, son of Zechariah in the wilderness. Uh, And now we know a few things about John. We know that he was... um, a bit eccentric, uh, so he wore clothes made of, uh, this is in the Gospel of Matthew, it says that he wore a, a camel clothing uh, and that he had a, a leather belt and that he ate locusts and honey and that he lived in the, the wilderness. And I've been to the area where he lived and it, it's just an inhospitable desert with some caves. It's really awful. That's where John lived. Uh, in fact, a lot of people think that John hung out with the Essenes. You may have heard of them before. So at the Uh, At the time of Jesus, there was a whole bunch of different kind of political parties. So you had the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Um, So the Pharisees were kind of more the the, the people loved them. The Sadducees were a little bit more complicit with Rome and they didn't believe in a whole bunch of things the Pharisees believed in, like the, the teaching of the elders. So all the extra stuff the Pharisees had invented that Jesus kept having a go at. The Sadducees didn't believe that. Uh, So there was the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and then there was this other eccentric group of religious fanatics called the Essenes who lived out uh, uh, just off the Dead Sea, up in the hills in these weird caves. And uh, and this is where we get the Dead Sea Scrolls from, was from the uh, the Qumran community or the the Essene community. And uh, there are a lot of people who think that John the Baptist lived with them and went through their ritual life and they were all about uh, ritual cleaning. So ritual cleaning is weird because they like have a they go through like water and like they do a baptism thing several times a day and like even like they baptize their their crockery and stuff they baptize all sorts of things but not to make it physically clean just to make it ritually clean uh, so they wouldn't actually get clean from it the water was often disgusting because they keep using it but they'd go in they'd get ritually clean they come out the other end so a huge part of John the Baptist's uh, kind of worldview assuming that he had come from that Essene community was a belief that there was a Messiah coming because it was a time of great turmoil in the world and there was lots of war and rumors of war and all the things that um, that were going on then, the Jewish people were hungering desperately for the Messiah to come. There was great unrest. The first century was, was a time that we talk about now knowing that it was uh, significant. Uh, but certainly at the time, the, the daily lived experience of people was uh, one of tension. And we know that by, by 70 AD, the Romans had completely wiped out most of that Jewish world in terms of their cities. Uh, so it was a time of great unrest. And into this great unrest, we have John the Baptist in his camel cloak and his leather belt, eating his locusts and honey, who's just kind of wandered out of the desert. And he has a message of hope, uh, which is amazing. You see, the message of Caesar was not one of hope. Uh, the, uh, the, the message of Caesar was, I will conquer everyone, and through violence and war, I will bring peace. You see, and that never works. Throughout history, everyone who has been a tyrant has said, well, if everyone does what I say, and if they don't, I'll kill them, uh, then we'll have peace. But that's not true peace. Uh, you see, in the, and in the temple and in the tetrarchies with the, uh, with the uh, Herod's sons, all of that was just a huge mess. And into all of this, John the Baptist comes with the word of the Lord and he brings a message of great hope. Uh, It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. He says, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come. And the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So the Son of God was was coming and and even now was beginning to minister uh, And John heralded the the beginning of this great hope that would truly bring peace to the world. Not the Roman peace and not the the peace of of Herod who was a tyrant and not the peace um, that the temple offered where you had to um, carry burdens that were impossible to carry. But John spoke of Jesus who carried a message of peace uh, where he would make all wrong things right. It was a time of uh, deeply... um, broken um, political systems and deeply broken um, authority structures and and they needed a savior and when I think about that now I think you know we're we're the same Uh, and it's really easy for us to get caught up in what's going on with Caesar and what's going on with the high priest or what's going on with within the tetrarchies and to not hear that the word of the Lord is just coming from from some guy in the hills and he brings a message of true peace and so I want to encourage you, be more concerned of, about the word of the Lord than you are concerned about the tweets of some megalomaniac leader, some crazy person in another country who wants to bring 
peace by, by, by being a warmonger. I want to encourage you to listen to the message of peace um, that comes from the Gospels, that comes from Jesus, the one that will overturn all of our structures in society and bring about justice for the downtrodden and bring about hope for those who have no hope. Um, the Gospel of Jesus uh, is one that says, to those who mourn, I will comfort. And to those who are in need, I will meet their need. And those who are hungry, I will feed them. And naked, I will clothe them. And to those who show mercy, I will show mercy. When we look at the message of Jesus, his standard for how we live is just simply to be kind to one another uh, and to love one another. So as a community of believers at this time, we need to stay focused on the message of Jesus, and that is the message in the Gospel of Luke and the message that uh, John the Baptizer was bringing, and that is a message of hope and peace and love for all mankind. I just want to pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you came uh, the way you did, not into a palace and not with uh, uh, fanfare and trumpets, but you came humbly. You came humbly to serve and then to live uh, a life of... Um, of kindness and a life of sacrifice and then to die, uh, and but then to defeat that death, to overwhelm death and to come um, back triumphant. So Heavenly Father, we know that your kingdom uh, has come, your kingdom is coming, and we pray that we would live in that reality. We pray that we would live knowing um, what John the Baptist was saying, uh, that there is one coming who will make all things right. I pray that we would be focused on that gospel and not the noise that comes from the world, especially in this time of, of turmoil, that we would listen uh, to your truth, uh, the real truth. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.